Good evening and welcome to World Politics. I'm your host, Bill Alford. There's a penetrating book, Fatal Embrace, authored by my guest, Mark Braverman. Put simply, American Christians have enabled Palestinian plight. Mark, welcome. Thanks, Bill. What is your essential message in Fatal Embrace? Feel free to speak up against the human rights abuses of the state of Israel. For the sake of Israel, for the sake of the Palestinians, and for the sake of world peace. Now, that's an interesting allusion. You talk about fatal embrace. You've given your book the, that, that title. What do you mean precisely by fatal embrace? The fatal embrace is between the Jewish people who feel that in order for them to be safe in the world today, they need a state of their own, even though it requires dispossessing another people, and the Christians in this country, by and large, who feel that because of their past abuses toward the Jewish people, they don't have the right to hold the Jewish people to account for what they're doing now to the Palestinians. That need that you referred to, really, wouldn't that encapsulate Zionism? The, the need for a land, the need for the, the Jewish people to... Zionism is a political ideology that comes uh, from Europe when the Jews decided that because it wasn't working for them in Europe, they needed a place of their own where they could be safe, where they could defend themselves, where they could live in dignity. After World War II, Christians looked at the ovens of Auschwitz and said, what have we done? They knew that there was something wrong with their theology, their theology that said that the Jews were the damned of God and that were being punished by God for killing uh, his son. And they knew that that theology was flawed and that it created a lot of evils. And they set out to fix it. That was a good thing. Do you think that the Vatican's recognition of Israel was, was an indication of that kind of atonement? Yes. Now, you talk about the role of interfaith dialogue. Is dialogue enough? Dialogue can be a problem. I mean, the problem with interfaith dialogue today between Christians and Jews is that there's a very strong underwritten rule. The rule is we can talk about anything we want, but Israel's off the table. And it's off the table mainly because of uh, what, what, what's the role of the synagogue in doing that, or the Jewish lobby, or the Jewish philanthropic uh, organizations? There's a very powerful um, complex of organizations. One, some of them are uh, political lobbies, some of them are Jewish philanthropic organizations, some of them are Jewish denominations, mm -hmm. all of whom work very, very hard to make sure that there is absolutely no threat to the flow of diplomatic and financial support to Israel from the United mm -hmm. States. Now, you, you're pretty out front about mentioning in your book that there's a dark side to Israel. I guess we could say Zionism. What exactly were you referring to? Bill, there's a dark side to every state. States do things that uh, are good. States do things that violate the rights of people who don't have a say or who may not be on top or in political power. Mm -hmm. Israel is no different. It happens to be true that Israel, um, among other nations in the world is guilty of massive human rights abuses. Mm -hmm. There's a 60-year-old refugee crisis mm -hmm. that Israel has created by dispossessing Palestinians in 1948 mm -hmm. and then again in 1967. And nobody is helping those Palestinian refugees. They're not allowed to go back to their homes. That's unprecedented in the world today. Do you think that a uh, world jury is seeing that? Most world jury is not aware of that because they, like me, have been brought up in the Zionist narrative. The Zionist narrative is that Israel is David mm -hmm. and the Arabs, as we used to call them, are Goliath. Mm -hmm. And we have to defend ourselves. And if some people have to suffer, it's too bad, but it's really important for Jews to be safe. The dark side. Are we getting in a little bit to the, the exceptionalism, to getting into the God's elect kind of issues? How do they play in this? They play very, very powerfully. That really is the dark side of Zionism um, and the dark side of Israel. Israel claims as the Jewish state to have a superior right to the territory of historic Palestine. Israel says we need to be in control. Other folks are dangerous. Uh, it's our land. We claim the right to it. Some do it on a political basis. We claim the right to it because we need it, because Europe didn't work for us. Some claim it on a religious basis because it says in the Bible that mm -hmm. God gave it to us. 
it's ours. Mm -hmm. The fact that other people happen to, happen to live there and have gotten dispossessed so that we can have it is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So that, that fact that there's a real estate deed involved in this covenant with God is actually rather wrong-headed, though, isn't it? You know, we have to take a look at the Bible uh, in conversation with history. The Bible does say, I mean, the story is, God said to Abraham, this is your land. All this, you know, is yours. That's in the Bible. That makes a point. You know, God had a plan for the human race, and he chose Abraham, and he said, Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. That doesn't mean that in the 21st century, that counts politically as a real estate deal. You mentioned also in your book that Christians should walk as Jesus. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. You didn't actually write that, but something similar. What exactly do Here's you mean? Here's what I said. I said, tens of thousands of Christians every year go on devotional pilgrimages to, to the Holy Land. And the word they use to that is, for that is, walk where Jesus walked. And the point that I make is that if you go to the Holy Land today, you will not only walk where Jesus walked, you will see what Jesus saw. Because what Jesus saw was the Roman Empire mm -hmm. basically dispossessing the Jews of the time. The Palestinians. And, and we'll see that today. You will see that today. You will see it done with taxes. You will see it done with laws. You will see it done by soldiers. You will see it done with illegal roads and land-grabbing walls. You will see an entire indigenous population being kicked off their land, not unlike what we did to the Native Americans here mm -hmm. in the United States. And you actually, you, you actually spent time on a kibbutz, if I'm not mistaken, in, in Israel. I lived on a kibbutz about uh, 40 years ago. I wasn't aware of the fact that that kibbutz, which had been given to a group of American Zionists who came and settled there and started a lovely, wonderful collective farm, and I lived there, and it's mm -hmm. a beautiful place. Now, 40 years ago, that was the heyday of Zionism, wasn't it? When uh, the Israeli army 60, was winning? 60 years ago about was when the state was founded. But the point about this kibbutz is that that was the scene of a massacre of Palestinians who lived there in 1948. And they were driven off. Mm -hmm. And they are now, their descendants are now living in squalid refugee camps in mm -hmm. Lebanon. I didn't know that when I lived in Israel mm -hmm. at the time. Now, neither did these, did these kibbutzniks. They're good people. They weren't aware of the fact that they were living on stolen land. Mm -hmm. why, why is it that, in a sense, you are really somewhat rare not, not completely rare, but, you know, I'm sure that you've been called self-hating Jew. And I feel that I'm much more in line with my own Jewish values today than I've ever been before. Mm -hmm. That's true. And, and this, this recognition uh, of the massacre when you were at the kibbutz, you think this is what motivated, primarily motivated you to, to take the, the course that you've taken? It was seeing the occupation. It was seeing the systematic humiliation and dispossession of good people being done in my name mm -hmm. that set me on this course. Is there any possibility of Palestinians and Israelis living together harmoniously? It's absolutely possible. Palestinians and Israeli Jews could get along just fine. If you take away the separation wall? If you take away the separation wall, if you, t if you, uh, if you take away the government policies of Israel, uh, and we're just fair to the Palestinians. There would be peaceful coexistence, and there would be a wonderful, wonderful society because they're both very talented, uh, very uh, smart people. Well, what, what would that mean for Zionism, though? Wouldn't, wouldn't it mean that it would have to be replaced? Be over, yeah. And that It's not a problem for me. It would, you would be back to Judaism or, you know, historical Judaism. Yeah, Judaism would back, be back to being an ethnic identity and for some a religion, which is what it needs to be. You know, before 1948, before the birth of the state, a majority of Jews thought the idea of a Jewish state was a bad idea. Jews should be like everybody else. They should be like Christians. They should be like Muslims. We shouldn't have a state of our own. We, as Americans, we don't like the idea of states and religions being tied together. We don't like... Christian states. We don't like the idea of an Islamic state. Why is a Jewish state a good idea? Mm -hmm. And clearly it isn't. Look mm -hmm. what's happening to Israel. It's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Now, didn't Ilan Pape write a book on that topic? He wrote a book called The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. He's a historian. And what he did was he deconstructed the Zionist narrative. 
he said it's not that uh, Israel was created by a small band of heroic Jews fighting off uh, bloodthirsty uh, Arab hordes. 1948 was a systematic project of kicking out an indigenous population to take the land over and make it only available for Jews. Mm -hmm. Now I want to go back to your, um, your rearing. We all get our religion from our parents, it seems. I don't know many people well, there are conversions later in life, but we're all reared in something. You were reared in Judaism, and basically, uh, when, when you were being reared, Zionism was to a large extent Judaism. Does that explain why there are so few people speaking out on this, well, if you think about it, pretty obvious social injustice in the Mideast? It goes very far to explaining a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, I was raised in a religion that was uh, inseparable from uh, political Zionism. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we prayed to the state of Israel in our prayers three times a day. Um, you actually we, worshipped the state of Israel? We had an Israeli flag on the pulpit. But do you, do you feel that it was idolatry? I do now. Yeah. I do now. Um, it was, you know, I don't know if I would go so far as calling it idolatry. It was a fantasy. It was, uh, it was a story that was not true. It was a romantic fantasy. Now, Israel, Israel was and is a wonderful place with wonderful people. But we were not told the full story. Mm -hmm. And until you know the full story, you can't really go on as a society. It's been important, for example, for Americans, for American society, to understand, acknowledge um, the ethnic cleansing that, uh, that we did uh, and the sins that we committed against the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. It makes us a better society to be able to look, ourselves at, look in the mirror and say, yes, we did that. Mm -hmm. Do you think the full story is, is, is today being told? You know, it's just about come out now. The, the truth is really surfacing. What about in synagogues, though? Are we hearing it from rabbis? Uh, by and large, we're not hearing from rabbis. I think the situation of rabbis in this country today is very similar to, say, a... Um, a white pastor in Birmingham, Alabama in the early 60s, you know, who if he got up and talked about integration uh, would have been out of town on the next bus. Oh, he certainly would have lost his uh, mandate to be the pastor. It, that's what I'm church. saying. He would have lost his job. He might have been run out of town until there was a movement that gained momentum led by certain courageous people where it became more and more acceptable mm -hmm. to stand up mm -hmm. and speak the truth uh, it was not possible to do that. Mm -hmm. It's not possible for most rabbis to take a courageous stand. Some are starting to do that. Right here in Seattle, there mm -hmm. are rabbis. I'm going to be in dialogue with one um, this evening mm -hmm. who are opening up the conversation, and that's what's important, that we mm -hmm. start to talk about it because the answers aren't easy. Now, do you feel that there's a schism within Judaism between... Uh, well, what a lot of people would just refer to as blind support for the state of Israel, almost the idolatry of Israel, and those, those humanistic social justice values that so uh, distinguished Judaism from before Zionism. Judaism is a wonderful religion. It's the basis of what's best about us in our Western civilization. And right now, Bill, Zionism is killing the soul of Judaism. You, you wrote about that, that there's some that fear the lost soul of Judaism, and you're saying that it's due to Zionism. Yes. How about the Nakba? Are people within the synagogues, within the Catholic pews, even aware to any extent of the Nakba? The Nakba, which is the Arabic word for catastrophe, which is how the Palestinians describe what happened in 1948, is starting to be talked about and learned about, certainly in uh, Christian congregations um, and among, in some Jewish circles. Um, you know, the Nakba is the Palestinian story, but it's also the Jews' story. We need to acknowledge the Nakba, just like as Americans, we need to acknowledge what happened to the Sioux and the Cherokee. When you were in the West Bank, was there an impressive person that you met? many, but one story sticks out in my mind. I was meeting with a woman named Lana who uh, works in Ramallah, which is the capital of the West Bank. She's a Palestinian woman. And uh, 
she commutes every day from Ramallah to Jerusalem, which is only about a, a five-mile uh, trip, but it can take uh, a long time for Palestinians if they have to go through checkpoints. And as you drive along this road, uh, you are accompanied the whole time by a 25-foot-high concrete wall, which uh, the Israeli government is building to grab huge chunks of Jerusalem, make it part of Israel, and then to leave the Palestinians on the other side. So she's driving along this road. She does it every day. and She has her eight-year-old daughter with her. And one day, out of the blue, her eight-year-old daughter pipes up and says to her, Mommy, why do they make the Jews live behind that wall? Interesting. It's a wonderful story because that little girl got it. You know, that little girl is being dispossessed, but she's really not the prisoner. The prisoner are the Jews who are building walls around themselves and who don't know their Palestinian cousins and, um, and will never learn to recover from 2,000 years of persecution if they continue to build walls to protect themselves. It's part because of our story. In a, in, a, in a sense, the kibbutz that suffered the massacre that you stayed at when you went to Israel was part of the Nakba, was it not? Yes, it was. And, and still the settlers are, are an out-of-control political force that somehow shape Israeli politics. Can you explain it? Well, many people probably don't understand it fully. They are. They're, they're not out of control. They're in control. They're wagging the dog. Uh, they have enormous political power in Israel. Uh, and the, uh, the Israeli army and the Israeli government is protecting these settlers who are illegal colonists on stolen land. So some, some sort of feedback loop. The politicians get support from the settlers and the settlers get support from the politicians. Yeah, and, but the point that I would like to make to Americans is that it's our tax dollars that are supporting these settlers and are supporting the illegal colonization um, of the West Bank and basically are supporting the construction of an apartheid structure in Palestine today. But when we talk illegal, or renegade Israeli settlers, are we talking really large numbers? Is it, is it something like 100,000 or... There are close to half a million settlers, Israeli Jewish settlers, in the West Bank today. A minority of them are highly ideological settlers who feel that they are there because God uh, wants them to be there. The majority are what we call economic settlers. They are Israelis who want a better standard of living and who are being settled there, again, with our tax dollars mm -hmm. in infrastructure that's being built mm -hmm. with our... American aid, uh, who can live there for a third of the price that it would cost to live in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And they're being settled there for that reason. But it's the government that's using them to colonize those mm -hmm. territories. Are you optimistic about uh, the future of Jewish values? Jewish values are Jewish values. They don't, they don't have a future of past or a present. They are what they are. I am pessimistic politically about what will happen to Israel, given that uh, Support for Israel is, you know, bipartisan and pretty much bulletproof in our Congress today, mm -hmm. and that our president, even a Democratic president who came into office saying, I'm going to fix this problem, seems to run, have run into the same political buzzsaw as every other president has over the past years. Well, that reminds me years. of a joke I heard. Why does Israel uh, not want to be the 51st state of America? Yes, yeah, so Ariel Sharon is asked, why would you not want to have, you know, why, why would you not want to be a state of the United States, the 51st state? And he said, then I'd only have two senators. <laughs> Anachronistic nationalism that, that we're seeing, can, can it continue seriously? Even if the United States does nothing, would it, would it, wouldn't it self-destruct? Yes, it will self-destruct. It's not sustainable. How would you, how would you wrap this up for viewers, let's, let's, the, the people who are watching that care? So there are Christians out there that, that want this interfaith dialogue. I'd, th I'd remind those Christians to think, I'd ask those Christians to think about what was it that brought about the end of Jim Crow America? What was it that brought about the end of racial segregation and racial... Uh, I think it was probably a lot of white people getting, becoming aware and joining. No, it was the black churches. It happened in the churches. It started in the black churches with courageous black leaders, and then the white churches followed. But the key word here is churches. It happened as a result of people of faith, mm -hmm. first Christians, and then Jews joined in. I remember my father was part of that in those days. Mm 
and many, many Jewish guys of my age participated. Mm -hmm. They changed the political wind in the United States. Mm -hmm. You know what they say about politicians. Politicians, they work like this. Which way is, which which way way is, is the, the wind, wind blowing? blowing? Yeah. And when politics fail, great social movements arise to change the wind and make the politicians do the right thing. How did we end apartheid South, uh, uh, South Africa? It was started in the churches in South Africa, and there was a broad international movement of people that made the politicians change those policies. I would remind Christians about that. We are witnessing the growth and the beginning of a broad movement to delegitimize what Israel is doing and save Israel from itself. So in a, in a way, what you're talking about is the new covenant that American Jewry, especially Israeli Jewry, conform with God. Well put. Yeah. Now, do you give credit to the sanction movement that changed South Africa from apartheid? Yeah, the economic sanctions. I think it's a great idea. It is a tried, true, and legitimate form of nonviolent opposition to oppression. It's moral, it's legitimate, it works. Are you familiar with Abraham Berg's book, the, uh, the Holocaust is Over? Yes. Do you see some application? For it's a good book. It's a good book. I mean, he writes, basically what Berg says is, the, Zionism was the, uh, the scaffolding that we used to build Israel, but now that we have Israel, we should let Zionism go and let it be in the past, uh, because Zionism really is causing a great sickness in Israeli society. It's making Israeli society militaristic. It's making Israelis think that they're all powerful. And this causes a very sick society. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are the role that's being played by Kadima and groups like Hillel? Kadima is a wonderful uh, example of uh, what's starting to happen in the American Jewish community today. Mm -hmm. um, it's a group of uh, Jews here in Seattle who feel very, very strongly that uh, there needs to be a conversation about difficult topics that may make Jews feel uncomfortable uh, but that will, in, the, in, in I think the truest Jewish sense, will make us look at ourselves, question ourselves, and think about what's really the right path, what does really God want mm -hmm. us to do. Do you see the, Pal the Presbyterians, excuse me, are they forging a new path as well? You know, the Presbyterians, among the major Protestant denominations, are several years ahead of the other denominations in taking an ethical stand here. What the Presbyterians have done uh, has said that if we look at our bylaws, mm -hmm. it says that we have to divest our pension funds from any companies that are involved in human rights violations. And so we should divest from certain international companies that are profiting from the occupation. I believe that they backed off from that. Wasn't there a lot of pressure on them and they had to... They passed the resolution and then they got enormous pressure. They really ran into a buzzsaw from the Jewish community, from the organized Jewish community. And yes, they backed off, but you know what? Every year they've gone right back into the fray and they are really fighting with it and they are really struggling for it and I give them a lot of credit. So with more Christians involved in this interfaith dialogue, it'll be easier for the Presbyterian as well as other denominations to uh, implement sanctions that will force a change. Ultimately, on. that's what's going to happen. In the meantime, there's a good conversation going on and that's extremely important. What about America, uh, Christian Zionism or Kufi with John Hagee? You know what? I think about what uh, Martin Luther King said in his letter from the Birmingham jail. He said, you know, I'm not so scared of the Ku Klux Klan. The people who really scare me are the white moderates. In uh, your book, you talked about getting the, the seminaries and the religion departments at universities to be uh, to, uh, basically return to their Christian principles, walk, walk like Jesus. How would you go about that? How can we make these seminaries and religion departments uh, fearlessly enter into interfaith dialogue and subscribe to the values that they espouse but seem to be blind when it comes to Israel? These are the religious leaders of the future. Um, they need to be asking these questions. They need to be exposed to the real facts and not to the um, sort of Zionist whitewash um, that the last three or four generations of uh, pastors uh, and rabbis in training have been exposed to. So I think what happens in the seminaries is critical. Now you also mentioned that, there's a, that we, we confuse the ancient Israel 
and the modern Israel. What exactly were you getting at? Ancient Israel is from the Bible. It's a story. It's a narrative uh, that had its function at the time that it was written and through the ages. It cannot be confused with a modern political state. We don't run things like that anymore. The fact that Palestinians have been there for thousands of years, never left, is that part of it? Doesn't it has matter. To be doesn't matter how long people have been there. The question is, who lives there now? And are their human rights being respected? It doesn't matter if they came yesterday or if they've been there for 3,000 years. We don't operate that way in the 21st century. So you're really not, are you taking a position on one state, two state, or something else solution to that problem? I'm not concerned about one state or two state. My question is, what kind of state is it going to be? Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned Jesus, and as a, as a Jew, is that typical? It's not typical. But I see Jesus as a great rabbi and a great prophet. And uh, I think we have a lot to learn from Jesus as someone who was able to speak truth to power. And I think we can learn a lot from that today. You know, I came home one day from speaking at a church, which I do a lot, and my wife, who's also Jewish, um, asked me, only half joking, because she sometimes expects the unexpected from me. She said, are you becoming Christian? And you know, I wasn't ready for the question, but I didn't miss a beat. I said to her, no, I think I'm really finally becoming Jewish. Well, I, I, I want to tell our viewers that your book was uh, certainly well regarded and that you appeared at the Sabell conference just recently. You gave a rousing talk. I look forward to reading the entire book and not just synopses of it. And uh, it's very, uh, very special of you, Mark, to come on and present your book, uh, Fatal Embrace, and to tell us what's in that book. And I want to thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure for me, Bill. Thanks.